It's an honor to be with you. Uh, I am Virgil Walker, a half of a dynamic duo known as the Just Thinking Podcast. Uh, I want to greet you on behalf of my, my partner in crime, so to speak, Daryl Harrison. He couldn't be with us today, but man, it is an incredible uh, honor to be with you. I want to thank Ryan. I uh, appreciate being a part of what's happening here in this space, the Standing for Freedom Center and uh, Liberty University. It's a joy to be with each and every one of you. Uh, for those unfamiliar with Just Thinking, it's a great podcast for you to check out. Uh, there are about six hours of content related to uh, critical race theory uh, and information regarding Black Lives Matter. I'd encourage you to, to take a listen. We don't only just do issues around critical race theory. Uh, we talk about theology. So if theology is important to you, uh, if issues around the culture are important to you, uh, I would encourage you to uh, take advantage of the podcast. The other thing that, that I would just briefly mention, I know that uh, I think Jared told me there's a bunch of you with books uh, from the just Thinking team. And so uh, if you have uh, one of our books, uh, Just Thinking About the State, uh, I'm here. I would love to meet you. Uh, love to shake your hand and, uh, and then sign that if I could. Well, as I begin my comments, let me say this. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so uh, let me get started. Long before the famous sports commentator, Stephen A. Smith, used the following phrase. It was Denzel Washington who was the lead role in the, in the movie Malcolm X. He was addressing a crowd as Malcolm X, and he said the following. Oh, I'll say it, and I'll say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. You've been bamboozled. You've been run amok, led astray. You've been lied to. Now, while it's unclear if Malcolm X ever coined that turn of phrase, but it was intended for the purpose of warning a black audience that they had been lied to about the white man into believing those things which were not helpful to blacks. Well, on this day, I say the same thing regarding critical race theory. As I believe any, any of those who have adopted its ideology and embraced its message, I would say this to you, my brother, my sister, you've been had, you've been took, You've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, run amok, led astray, and lied to. <laughs> Critical race theory and those who promote it actually care nothing for black people. Nor do they care for the people of color that they claim to help. On the contrary, they aim to convince others of the helplessness of blacks, that they can, they're helpless to do anything, to go anywhere, or to succeed at any time. The effort and energy behind those promoting the false religion of CRT are twofold. First, they desire money, and boy, have they acquired quite a bit of it. The other thing that they desire is power. And they're trying their best to, to engage the, the halls of power for the purpose of accumulating all the more. What they actually desire to do, like much, many of the prosperity preachers of our day, these prophets of poverty desire to strip communities of color. I'm going to use their vernacular. They desire to strip communities of color of any drive or determination or any direction that they might have, thus leaving those communities beholden to the same white man to save them that CRT advocates claimed enslaved them to begin with. That's quite a problem. Those claiming to fight white supremacy using the lens of CRT, they are the real white supremacists. According to their worldview, whiteness is God. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present as we're unable to escape the presence of whiteness. And finally, he's omniscient, waking up every day with the exact knowledge of where to oppress people of color and when to do so. It's the CRT advocate, crits as they call themselves, who are the true white supremacists. Let me say it again. I want to be crystal clear. Is my mic on? <laughs> CRT is the real white supremacy.
All of this is clear to anyone who's paying attention. When a soccer mom or soccer dad shows up to a school board meeting to say that they won't allow racist ideology to be taught to their children in schools, we know that things are in the process of changing. However, what we need to remember is that cultural Marxists are experts at deconstructing language. So they'll end up looking you in the face or they'll look into the nearest camera on CNN or MSNBC and they'll tell you straight to your face that CRT isn't being taught in our schools. Well, that's because they've changed the language. They've deconstructed language. They're, they're using all kinds of different language to, to categorize and codify these kinds of ideologies. Now they're using words like social-emotional learning, SEL. With all of this, we as believers in Christ, we shouldn't be surprised by the schemes of the world. Daryl and I say it often, we expect the world to world. We, we talk about it on our, on, our, on our episodes. We expect the world to world. But sadly, as we've watched church culture over the past two years, it's been puzzling to see so many evangelicals professing believers in Christ adopt the ideologies of the world, particularly with the full embrace of critical race theory, either in part or in whole. We see it in far too many of our nation's pulpits. It's also infected our institutions of higher learning, religious schools, Bible colleges, and seminaries. The Apostle Paul and his admonition to the church at Ephesus explained that the purpose of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that, he continues, they may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4, 14. But sadly, far too many pastors and teachers have neglected this duty. And they've embraced the false religion of critical race theory. The question that has to be asked and then answered is, how, how did this foreign idea invade evangelical circles? For many, it's a bit of a mystery. As others during the course of the last day or so have explained, we face the issues regarding cultural Marxism. It's the same cultural Marxism that was instituted by men like Max Horkheimer, the German philosopher and sociologist who gave us the Frankfurt School and applied critical race theory on a larger scale. When you combine an, a, a godless ideology like critical theory with religious fervor, religious fervor from men early in our time here in America like Walter Rauschenbusch and his social gospel of the early 1900s, you mix that with liberation theology and black liberation theology of the 1960s and 70s with men like Gustavo Gutierrez and, and James Cone, and you have what begins to be the, the framework, if you will, the foundation for what we're facing with critical race theory. It's men like these, particularly James Cone, who actually laid the groundwork to, to take the, the godless ideology and infiltrate it into a systematic theology, if you will. This is what was happening now for the first time in our country. Some would argue that the match that ignited the flame of CRT within evangelicalism actually happened on May 25th, 2020, the day that George Floyd was tragically killed. I would argue that what allowed CRT to kick down the doors of churches actually happened as biblical illiteracy increased and biblical sufficiency decreased within our churches. This phenomenon, the increase of biblical illiteracy and the decrease of biblical sufficiency actually paved the way for CRT within evangelicalism in two ways. Let me lay those out for you. First was the embrace of pragmatism. You see, in, in, in the vacuum that is biblical literacy or biblical illiteracy and biblical sufficiency, once that's gone, something has to fill the void. What ends up filling the void is pragmatism. And pragmatism is the idea that whatever works must be right and true simply because it works. The second thing that became a part of the culture, church culture in particular, was the acceptance of sentimentalism. Sentimentalism says whatever feels right must be right and true. Let me give you an example of this culturally speaking. In 2020, as city blocks burned following the death of George Floyd, cultural sentimentalism was on full display. Sentimentalists actually ignored the business owner who had nothing to do with the death of George Floyd, but in instead turned, they turned their attention on the person perpetrating the crime. 
Why? Well, because the the story of the person perpetrating the crime seemed to have more sentimentality to it. They hadn't risen anywhere as of yet. And the person with the business had had done something for themselves. So in the mind of the sentimentalist, the, the, the story with the greater feeling, with the greater emotion wins the day regardless of the truth that's underneath it. As businesses burned to the ground, the violent perpetrator's actions were seen as giving voice to the voiceless. The problem with sentimentalism is that it begins when rational thinking is abandoned in favor of one's feelings. Unfortunately, current class warfare, our current class warfare of oppressed versus oppressor groups actually exacerbates this problem. One of the problems created by what I'll call the the anesthetic of sentimentalism is that it abandons sola scriptura, scripture alone, for sola sentimentalismi, sentimentalism alone. In this new environment, those seeking so-called analytical tools like critical race theory actually thrive. So, so those who are in the, in the culture who want to advance critical race theory within evangelicalism, this context actually helps them to thrive. Why? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because it, it feels good to believe that what's required to address the sin of racism in particular is this idea of special knowledge that cannot be uh, assessed or understood apart from the lens of critical race theory. Sentimentalism and the pragmatism that actually precedes it gives us this high view of self, while at the same time providing us a low view of the scripture. Once this happens, we replace the holiness of God for the hollowness of self. We minimize sin. We maximize partiality. And then we deconstruct all the boundaries that are initiated by God in the scripture. Before the invasion of critical race theory into the bloodstream of the, of the church culture, there were heavy doses of anesthetic, the anesthetic of sentimentalism that had to be applied so that the pain of CRT would be innocuous to the follower of Christ. Long before George Floyd, evangelicalism had been experiencing this dulling impact. It was sentimentalism that opened the doors for ideas around seeker sensitivity and, and the emergent church movements. It encouraged the embrace of cultural relevance and pop culture pragmatism. It it embraced the idea of social justice in our churches. I love when one of the panelists was talking about the importance of, of knowing what true justice actually is and how it actually operates so that we can stand on truth rather than the idea that the culture provides for us. The fruit of this root was evident shortly after the George Floyd impact, right? There were numerous Facebook posts and blog articles and podcasts and even sermons that spent time explaining the plight of the black man and the need for whites to repent of their whiteness. Of course, none of those who were interested in really getting an opinion of a a quote-unquote black voice had uh, had, had any thought about calling me. I would have had a different story for them had they called. Evangelicalism following cultural cues adopted the black narrative of black victimhood and oppression and began calling for racial reconciliation. Allow me to slow down here because I want to make something absolutely clear. We who believe in Christ, you and I, as followers of Christ, are already reconciled both to God the Father and to one another through the finished work of Christ Jesus. Rather than seeking revelation through the whole counsel of God's word, many churches sought cultural relevance and adopted the culture's language on these issues. Far too many pastors were were tripping over their, their skirts, racing to be the first to step into the pulpit to say the phrase, Black Lives Matter, all the while disconnected from studying the hashtag movement's origin. Bible studies were no longer assigned the, the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, And instead, these groups were told to study D'Angelo and Tisby and Kendi 
Church leaders often advised followers to seek discussions on race, abandon whiteness, check their privilege, and understand the cultural cues through a uniquely ethnic lens. I still don't have that lens. I think somebody took it from me a while back. <laughs> As it pertains to this cultural moment, our circumstances don't require new programs or new policies. They require men and women who have boldness to stand upon the truth that's found in the Word of God. This cultural moment requires pastors and church leaders to stop capitulating to the culture and to be willing to stand on truth at all costs. We must remember, you can clap for that. We, we must remember that, that our historical roots are the result of men and women who were willing to die for what they believe. The panel that was before me, you saw young people willing to take a stand, even at great cost. It's imperative that we, who are the believers in Christ, begin to develop a, a doctrine of suffering that allows us to take the stand that we need to take in our day and time. As I close, allow me to do so by reminding you of the words of Paul as he would write to Timothy. He, he would first write a, a warning, warning Timothy, and then an encouragement. First, the warning from 2 Timothy 3, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. They read this way. But understand this. So here's the warning. That in the last days there will come difficult times. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control. They'll be brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. And then finally, the encouragement, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, I charge you, Timothy. This, this doesn't sound like a, a defeated Paul at all. He's, he's, he's charging Timothy to, to take a stand. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing kingdom. I wish I had time to exegete that passage of Scripture for you today. He instructs him to preach the word, to be ready in season and out to re reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to truth and wander off into myths. It's as if Paul, as he's writing this, peers into the, 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 the cosmic uh, uh, future and recognizes the day in which we live. I would simply argue that he, he's really peering into the, the natural part of the human condition. Any one of us separated from Christ, alienated from God, we would operate in the same way. I said it earlier, we expect the world to world, but not you. You have a responsibility to uphold that which has been entrusted to you, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there was one who came and lived a perfect life and died a death he did not deserve on a Roman cross in an effort to, to, to redeem mankind, in an effort to allow you, if you would but repent of sin and place your faith in Christ, to have eternal life. That eternal life is the light of the world. My charge to you is to take that gospel with you wherever you go. That's when you'll see real change in the lives of those who need it most. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>